Hi everyone, my name is Noor Fahmi and I'm a data scientist at Hashtag Paid and also a member of the steering committee here at ACE. If you guys have never heard of us or have heard of ACE, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To see more, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all of the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have 14 different streams that are focused on various ML topics, and this session is in Math and Foundations. Hope you enjoy it and come back. And today I am so excited because we have Professor David Banks from Duke University talking to us about agent-based modeling. Thank you very much, Noor. Uh, I'm going to go to full screen mode. Does this work for everybody? Yep. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy this. I'm going to be talking about agent-based models and the ways in which statistics has failed the world. Uh, agent-based models arise in lots of circumstances. Um, for example, you can have agent-based models for weather forecasting, and there the agents are cubic kilometers of atmosphere that exchange pressure, temperature, and humidity according to atmospheric physics laws. And what one wants to see is the emergent behavior as the weather front rolls across uh, a country. Um, another example are auctions, which happen in Yahoo and Google, uh, and there the agents are virtual representatives of companies that are making bids to show their ad to your eyeballs. So if you type in pizza, Domino's and Pizza Hut and lots of other companies will all decide whether or not to try and show you their ad, and they'll try and figure out how much they should bid to get your attention. Uh, and that's an interesting sort of uh, situation. Uh, other famous examples include uh, transims models where the agents are drivers that space themselves out on the road uh, and respond to the actions of other drivers. And there the questions might be, uh, what type of congestion one, what will one encounter? What happens if we close a bridge? How much delay will that cause? Those types of things. Um, if you think about it, supply chains, disease spread, and genetic algorithms are all places where one can use agent-based models. Um, one example that I like is by civil engineers who need to study how long it takes to evacuate a building. Uh, so what they will do is they will create a virtual building uh, according to their blueprints. They will throw 100 people down at random inside that building, and these virtual agents have certain rules that they follow. One of the rules might be when the fire alarm goes off, go to the nearest exit. Uh, if that exit is blocked, go to the next nearest exit. And then they'll do a hundred different runs of this, setting the people initially at random in the building each time. And they make a histogram of the time for the required for the last person to leave the building. And if that time is short enough, then the building passes its safety inspection. And otherwise, they change the design to add more staircases or, or something else. Uh, Agent-based models began back in the 1940s with uh, John von Neumann and Stanislav Ulam talking about cellular automata, the most famous of which is uh, uh, Conway's Game of Life. Uh, that line of thinking led to the development of interactive particle systems. And some of the famous people there are Frank Spitzer and David Griffith. And they used uh, ideas from uh, physics to study phase changes and dynamical systems. Uh, but in the early 90s, people developed more complicated interaction rules, and um, they started to develop more sophisticated simulations. And the field moved away from pure mathematics and physics and into social science and economics and uh, certain other types of physics. Uh, and these models are ubiquitous. Uh, they're sort of easy to face validate. They're easy to program. And so uh, they've been used in lots and lots of different fields. Ecologists use them. Epidemiologists use them. They're all over the place. I want to start off by talking about two famous examples in which these uh, agent-based models were used. One was uh, a book called Growing Artificial Societies by Josh Epstein and uh, Rob Axtell. And uh, they imagined um, a 
world that was a um, a flat plane, and at the lattice points of the Cartesian coordinate system on that plane, something called sugar grew at a constant rate. And they placed virtual agents at various locations in the sugarscape. And one of the simple rules was you consume all the sugar at your lattice point, and then you look as far as you can in all the directions, north, south, east, and west. And if you see a lattice point that doesn't have an occupant, but does have a lot of sugar, you go there and you consume the sugar. Uh, and when they built those rules in, what they found is they got uh, migration patterns that were very much like the uh, patterns that hunter-gatherers uh, uh, show in uh, human tribes. Uh, so uh, they added additional rules to create more complexity. They added sex. And when there's sufficient sugar, two agents could reproduce that led to age pyramids, carrying capacity, tribal growth of co-movement and fission, and lots of other demographic properties. Here's an example of some of the rules. Uh, the first one is the sugar escape grow back. At each lattice position, sugar grows at a rate of alpha. Uh, and so that's a simple rule, but alpha is an unknown parameter. Well, they get to set it, but if you wanted to try and model human behavior, we would need to estimate alpha from something observable. Um, second rule concerns agent movement. That means that the agent looks as far as their vision permits in each of the four lattice directions and then moves to an unoccupied new position that has uh, the most resources. The mating rule says uh, if you have a neighbor at another adjacent lattice point and if that neighboring agent is of the opposite sex and if the agents are fertile and if at least one of the agents has an empty neighboring site, then there's a newborn that's produced and that's going to cross over the parents' genetic and cultural characteristics, which come from other rules later on. Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, went further, they added spice, and then they had a barter economy, in which people would trade sugar to for spice. They added tags, which are sort of cultural means, and uh, they can be transmitted, and uh, and you might try and persuade people who have different tags to adopt your tag. Uh, that leads to Herbert Spencer's type of cultural evolution. It turns out that in all, 17 rules produced a rich range of social behavior. And at that point, the sociologists were totally on board with agent-based models. And one currently pretty hot area of ABM work is to develop uh, agent-based models for social network formation. The second model I want to talk about is uh, from Kaufman, uh, and he wanted to show how DNA could give rise to many different types of tissue, because in our bodies we observe that we have bone tissue, we have uh, neural tissue, we have uh, skin tissue, we have liver tissue, uh, and so he was curious about that, and he imagined that um, uh, what you have is a network of genes and each gene is either turned off or turned on, zero or one, depending upon the inputs that it receives from other genes in the network. Uh, and he imagined that the genes receive this input, calculate a Boolean function, and then send a binary output to other genes to which it is connected. So if a gene receives k inputs, then there are two to the k possible vectors of outputs. And for uh, each given vector of input, there are two possible outputs, zero or one. So the number of possible functions that map a set of k binary inputs into 0 and 1 is 2 to 2 to the k. And to make this a little more concrete, imagine that we are uh, looking at this network here. You'll note that 1 receives an input from gene 5 and from gene 3. And there, this uh, network only has or or and Boolean operators. So um, the first one is and, zero and zero is a zero, zero and a one is a zero, one and zero is a zero, one and one is a one. This is the or operator, zero and zero is zero, zero, one, 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 zero, they all go to one. And here is the tautological operator, which always produces one. So here, if uh, gene one, receives a one from a three and a one from a five, 
then we're here, one, one, and one, that means it's going to output a one. So it's going to send a one to two, and it's also going to send a one to four. And so that would be the type of genetic network that Kaufman was interested in. If I initialize with gene one being zero, uh, gene two being one, gene three being zero, gene four being zero, and gene five being one, then at the next step, the Boolean operators produce one, zero, zero, one, one. At the next step, it produces one, zero, one, 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 and then it goes to one, 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 and it just cycles there. If we start down here, uh, unfortunately, there's something that's covering, uh, okay, yes. If we start out with zero, zero, one, zero, one as the initialization, then it goes to one, zero, 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 and then it just cycles among these three uh, representations. If we start here, it cycles at zero, 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 zero. Uh, and the final situation is this one. So what we observe here is that we have uh, four basins of attraction, and uh, this network is going to get drawn into one of them. And in Kaufman's thinking, this meant that um, the same genetic code, depending on its initialization, could produce four different tissue types. And he did some math, and he found that the number of stable behaviors is asymptotically equal to about the square root of n, where n is the number of nodes. And, um, and that actually squares with uh, genetic studies that indicate that uh, uh, the number of different tissue types that different organisms uh, uh, show is approximately root n, where n is a measure of the amount of genetic material that they have. Uh, it also corresponds to other nice things that we observe in real life uh, genetics, that small perturbations that flip a zero to a one tend not to have uh, a difference. You still remain within the same basin of attraction. So those two papers were some of the motivations for the modern popularity of agent-based models. Uh, but uh, nowadays, agent-based models typically entail many agents, often with differentiated roles and different rule sets. For example, in the uh, case of trying to study how much time it takes to evacuate a building, you can imagine that many agents just follow the rules, go to the uh, nearest exit and leave. Other agents might be fire marshals that tell people not to go to the southwest corner, go to the northeast corner instead. Uh, and you can imagine that there's some agents whose rule is go to my desk, get my laptop, and then leave. Uh, Agent-based models have more complicated rule sets now, uh, and uh, sometimes the rules are heuristic, and sometimes one has randomized rules. And uh, we saw some of that in the uh, uh, sugar scape situation. Uh, some of the rules, like the constant growth rate of sugar, that's sort of a tunable parameter. Uh, but uh, you can also have randomized rules, in which case, uh, for example, if you are sitting if you have two people of the opposite gender on each side of you in your lattice, then you might randomly pick which one to have a child with. Uh, agents learn about their environment, including other agents. And uh, there's a famous study of Prisoner's Dilemma that was done by Axelrod that sort of talks about how agents interact with each other and learn their types. Uh, Generally, there's an interaction topology, and it defines uh, which, interact, which agents interact with each other. Uh, usually, this has to do with agents that are nearby in a geography. Uh, but, uh, but for the auction example that we did, it's a star graph, because the agents don't interact with each other. They interact with the uh, business that is placing the ads on the, on the site, so displaying the ads. And finally, we often have a non-agent environment. And in the sugarscape situation, it's the Cartesian coordinate system that's growing sugar. That's the non-agent environment. Uh, but it could be much more complicated. Uh, many people are interested in using agent-based models to explore human decision-making because it's fairly easy to uh, build in what economists call bounded rationality or limits on how much calculation an agent does and they want to see if they can produce uh, 
agent behavior that mimics human behavior in the marketplace. But sadly, very few statisticians have looked at agent-based models. Unlike linear models, we generally don't know how to assess fit, we don't know how to estimate parameters, and we don't know how to make quantified statements of our uncertainty about predictions. And that's a real problem because it's a model like the linear model, uh, but it poses special challenges and statisticians really haven't stepped up to the game. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, Hooten and Weichel uh, introduced Bayesian hierarchical modeling into ABM research, and it applies to some agent-based modeling problems. Uh, and in particular, they applied it to a spatiotemporal process with a fairly simple structure. Uh, they were interested in the spread of rabies in raccoons in Connecticut between 1991 and 95. They had a gridded map that represented all the townships in the state of Connecticut, uh, and they indicated a zero or one to show whether or not rabies was absent or present. So it was a very simple structure there. Uh, but their agent-based model allowed the disease spread to follow the Connecticut River, which was realistic and important, and other models had trouble with that. Uh, for this talk, I'm not going to get into the math details. Uh, I will simply say that they had a model that said that this binary variable, 0 or 1, depending upon all the other values for the variables around that, followed some distribution that depended upon uh, 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 a function of the binary presence or absence of rabies at all the other nearby townships. Uh, and it turns out that this model, if we assumed normality, then this would simply be a Gaussian state space model and we'd be able to solve everything in closed form. But obviously they weren't assuming uh, uh, normality because they had binary responses and they wanted to have a more realistic function H that describes how the binary variables depend on uh, the past binary variables and the geographic location. So. Uh, how are they able to make that work, and why can't we do that for agent-based models in general? And the reason is that in agent-based models, we cannot write down the likelihood function, except in some very rare cases. Leah Johnson has done some of that, uh, but in general, you can't write down the likelihood. And when we don't have the likelihood, statisticians have only two tools that we can use. We can use emulators, which build a tractable model that approximates the agent-based model, or we can do approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, and both are interesting approaches. Uh, Marion Farrar, Daniela DeAngelis, and some co-authors examined emulators in the context of an agent-based model for the spread of H1N1 influenza. And Daniel Hurd, in his PhD thesis, compared emulators and, agent, and approximate Bayesian computation in the context of HIV spread and simulated drug markets. And Daniel found that the emulators seemed to be more robust, more reliable. Uh, so that's sort of what he thinks is the way to go. Uh, there was work in climate forecasting at NCAR and explosion simulation at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, that has led to a new approach to calibrating computer models. This is closely related to validation and uh, and it's pertinent to agent-based models. Uh, the goal is to use experimental data to improve the calibration model parameters uh, in the rule sets, to make predictions with uncertainty at new input values, and to estimate systematic discrepancies between the agent-based model and the emulator that approximates it. Uh, I am not going to do a deep dive on this, but let me simply say that uh, What's going on is we um, imagine that the emulator produces a set of outputs here that depend upon the inputs X sub I, and the agent-based model does this, uh, is the uh, psi function, and we have noise here that represents randomness that might occur in the agent-based model or something that uh, uh, arises in some other way. So, <clears throat> Psi is the real or average performance uh, response of the ABM uh, at X sub I, and uh, epsilon of X sub I is just random disturbance. The emulator is eta of X i and theta, 
where theta are calibration parameters. And the model is that the agent-based model is equal to this emulator plus a discrepancy function plus the noise term. And we're going to try and find the correct value for theta, the best value for theta, and, uh, and the best emulator. It's going to minimize this discrepancy term. It's an approach developed by uh, oh, Tony O'Hagan and others that uh, uh, we don't really need to get into unless anybody wants to ask questions about it later on. The punchline is that you go through some math, do Markov chain Monte Carlo, and at the end, you get posterior distributions for uh, eta function, which is the thing that's calculated by the emulator. You get uh, the opt uh, distribution for the optimal calibration parameter theta. Uh, you get the calibrated emula emulator, eta of x and theta. You get a posterior distribution for the uh, agent-based model. And amazingly, most importantly, you get a posterior distribution for the discrepancy function over x. So that tells us where our emulator is doing a good job and where our emulator is doing a poor job. So we have a complicated agent-based model to do weather forecasting thing. And it takes two days to run. And that's not very helpful because predicting tomorrow's weather, you need to get it faster than two days. Uh, so uh, we'll build an emulator that is a, typically a Gaussian process approximation to the agent-based model. And that emulator uh, is our quick and dirty way of approximating the agent-based model. But we're also gonna learn the discrepancy function. And that will tell us that our emulator does a really good job of predicting the weather in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Midwest, uh, the Northeast, but it does a lousy job in the Southwest and it's not that great in the Deep South. So that's the type of information that we get from this. And my view is that uh, this emulator tool is the way in to making quantified statements of uncertainty from agent-based models and for tuning the agent-based models by finding the theta that makes the emulator as faithful as possible to the agent-based model. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, model validation. And there's sort of five main approaches, physics-based modeling, what I call intelligent design, face validity, comparison to another model, and then the best comparison to the world. Uh, Physics-based ABMs are typically used in very simple systems where hard science is known. And an example might be the n-body problem or an easing model. Uh, if you have uh, n planetary bodies sitting in the in space, and uh, they have certain masses and they have certain uh, velocities and directions, then one can use an agent-based model in a very straightforward way to try and predict where each of these planetary bodies will be in the future. And so at each time step, they operate upon each other according to Newtonian physics, and they move uh, to the place that they need to go the next time tick. Uh, <clears throat> intelligent design is the most common way to validate an agent-based model. Uh, experts think through the simulation carefully, uh, building or approximating all the effects that they think are substantial, and then they hope that they've been smart enough uh, and try and see if their results look reasonable. Uh, intelligent design can handle more complicated situations in the physics-based models, but there's no test for statistical validity, and intelligent design is basically like writing software, and we all know how buggy software can be. Face validity is the first case with a true validation protocol. Here, the designer tests the ABM by using selected endpoints to explore the output behavior. For example, uh, I might say, okay, I want to predict weather in the Pacific Northwest when the temperature is uh, 65 degrees, when the uh, humidity in the area is 40%, and when the wind is from the Southwest. Uh, and then it will look at what the weather forecasts come, what the weather forecasts for that uh, initializations um, gives you. And it can check that uh, to see if this behavior is reasonable or if it conforms with historical patterns. Uh, 
ideally the inputs that you use to sort of validate the uh, model are chosen in a smart way, say with the Latin hypercube design, uh, uh, but there are other ways of doing that. Uh, face validation is going to fail when the parameter space is huge uh, and there are many interactions, but to some extent it is used in systems such as episims, which are used to model the spread of uh, diseases and the battlefield simulations that are produced at the Defense uh, Modeling and Simulation Office. Uh, Model comparison is rarely done, but I think it has the potential to be really huge. Um, you have a better way, it's a better tool for exploring the, the full dynamic range of model behavior. And I see that as uh, uh, very nice. Uh, one theoretical issue is it's hard to decide when one agent-based model is nearly equivalent to another model, or perhaps is a proper subset of another agent-based model. Uh, and uh, that's important if one ABM is faster than another. Uh, it's also quite possible that one ABM takes too much detail into account. Uh, when Daniel Hurd was looking at the simulations of the drug markets by the Research Triangle Institute, uh, he found that they were really overcomplicating their agent-based models. Um, they were looking at every step potential customers took as they entered an area where drugs were being sold and they were just micro modeling the hell out of it. And uh, it would have been much better to have a more approximate model that ran faster, but nonetheless was sufficiently faithful to reality. Uh, in some cases, you can actually compare the agent-based model to the real world and that's, that's great. Uh, and uh, that's the strongest form of validation. Still, it's not quite adequate because um, Agent-based models, you want to do what-if experiments. Uh, weather forecasting is a bad example, but the evacuation of the building is a good one. You can do a what-if experiment to say what happens if there's a fire at stairwell 7 and people can't use it. Then how does that affect the time it takes for the last person to leave the building? So there you're doing uh, uh, an agent-based model uh, prediction for a situation in which you cannot observe the real world. And so that's um, that's the drawback in trying to validate an ABM with real worlds. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned before, an agent-based model is just like the linear model, except we don't know how to use it. We can't assess goodness of fit in a useful way. Uh, we cannot estimate the parameters in an agent-based model in a principled way. And we cannot, cannot make quantified statements of uncertainty about the predictions from the agent-based model. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, bear upon this a little bit longer. Um, here is an example of um, sexual relationships among 832 students at an anonymized high school called Jefferson High by, uh, in a paper by sociologist Behrman, uh, Behrman, Moody, and Stovall. And you'll see here there were 63 monogamous couples. There were 12 couples in which one boy was with two girls at some point during the school year. Uh, there's uh, a case in which uh, nine cases in which a girl was with two guys. Uh, and then we have the sort of filamentary structure that we see here. So that represents uh, sexual relationships among the 832 students. Uh, so uh, the researchers were interested in what encourages people to form a romantic relationship? And it turns out that uh, if you were the same race, that increased the pro uh, probability of hooking up. If you both smoked or you both different, didn't smoke, that increased the chance of uh, hooking up. And if you were op opposite genders, that increased the chance of hooking up. Uh, so the sociologists fit a logistic regression model to all of this, and then they um, used an agent-based model to generate random networks that had the same degree counts, had the same racial smoking and gender crosslinks, and then they looked at the simulated networks produced by the agent-based models. And those networks didn't look at all like this. They looked like balls of yarn, whereas this has sort of filamentary structure that uh, is pretty striking. And one of the sociologists got really smart, and he noticed that there were very few four cycles in this uh, network. 
So a force like it occurs if Bob and Carol are together and if Ted and Alice are together, but then Bob dumps Carol and takes up with Alice. And a force like it occurs if uh, 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 Ted and Carol get together, the two people who are dumped uh, hook up. And when they added an additional rule to the agent-based model that prohibited four cycles, then they got the fill in -terry structure that we see here. And that seemed to work uh, really well. So um, sociologists believe that in high school, uh, there's no status gain to be had when the two dumpies get together. That just sort of seems pathetic. Their prestige is better to go um, with new people. And so that's why they hypothesized that there were a few four cycles in the data. But that's an example of uh, uh, the need to sort of uh, uh, validate the agent-based model that you're using. And it points out that it can be really hard and requires subtle thinking to do. Uh, I was told 30 to 40 minutes. I'm going to go through some of the rest of this quickly. Uh, I am sure that everybody has seen models for epidemic spread now because that's what the world is all about. Uh, the standard kermack mckendrick model basically says that um, the change in the rate of infection, the change in the rate of susceptibles, and the change in the rate of recovered really depends on only two parameters. Uh, but agent-based models are used to simulate uh, epidemics. Uh, they are much more complicated than simply having two hidden parameters. But nonetheless, qualitatively, the properties of the epidemic indicate that you know, the agent-based model is more complicated, but really there's sort of only a few knobs, a few parameters that are really driving behavior. Nonetheless, agent-based models are useful because you can see what will happen if we close the elementary schools. Will that slow the spread of the disease? How much impact will that have? Uh, how many hospital beds are we going to be needing as the disease moves through uh, the population? Uh, those are useful. There was a famous study um, of Ebola in Liberia, and agent-based models were great at predicting how many villages were going to come down with um, uh, uh, Ebola in the next week. But they were lousy at predicting where those villages were. And it makes sense because basic epidemiology tells you pretty easily how often somebody in Monrovia, the capital, is going to start to feel bad. And this guy sitting on a bus in Monrovia says, I'm, I'm not feeling good. I will go back to my village. My parents and family will take care of me. Uh, so it can predict how many people are going back to a village, but it can't predict where their village is located. So that shows both the strength and the weakness of agent-based models in studying disease spread. Um, I want to talk a little bit about intrinsic dimensionality. Um, the kermit mckendrick model had sort of two intrinsic dimensions. Agent-based models are more complicated, but nonetheless, the epidemiology of an agent-based model is going to be driven by a small number of uh, parameters, and it's probably going to be close to two. But if I write a really complicated agent-based model for weather forecasting or predicting who's going to become friends with whom, uh, I have no way of knowing what the true dimension of that space is, that model is. Uh, I mentioned the uh, researchers at uh, the Research Triangle Institute, RTI, they were building incredibly elaborate models for the commerce in the drug market. Uh, and they included lots of details that they really didn't need to include. And so I would like to have a principled way to understand what is the essential dimensionality of that model. If you're familiar with principal components regression, what you can imagine doing is you'll throw a small ball down in the output space from your agent-based model. And you look at all the points in that ball and you fit a principal components regression model and you see how many principal components are needed to explain, say, 80% of the variation in the outcome. And if you throw a ball down in one place and it takes two principal components to explain 80% of the variation, then locally that agent-based model is two-dimensional. You throw the ball down somewhere else and maybe it takes 
three principal components to explain 80% of the variation. So locally, that agent-based model is three-dimensional in that region of the output space. And you throw these balls down all over the place, and you see how many principal components you need to explain some substantial fraction of the variation. And then the average of those is a measure of the approximate intrinsic uh, dimensionality of your agent-based model. I'm not going to get into details, but let me jump ahead. This is what I call a one cube in a three space. And visually, it's perfectly obvious that you have um, uh, the data are mostly lined up on one dimensional uh, subsets in a three dimensional space. This is a similar plot uh, for a 10 dimensional space. So here we have a one cube in R10 tilted 10 degrees out of norm. Uh, and it's a mess. We can't see the one dimensional structure that's hidden in this 10 dimensional space. Uh, so what we would like to have is some way of estimating the intrinsic dimension. Uh, and I'm going to just show you the results from this computer experiment. Here's the dimension of the space is one, two, three, up to seven. Here's the dimension of the cube that's hidden in that space. So it could be one dimensional, a one cube, a two cube. A two cube, you're looking at the faces of a cube. A three cube, you're looking at the interior of a cube. And for four and higher dimensions, we're talking about the natural uh, generalizations of cubes. And what you observe is that in a one dimensional space to explain, uh, get 80% of the variation explained, you have an average local dimension of 0.8 which is exactly what it should be. And then as we increase the apparent dimension, so as we go up from one dimension up to seven dimensions, less than the 10 that I showed you a minute ago, we see that we get an estimate of the true dimension that is slightly biased down, but it's very stable and we could de-bias it. It is biased because we're looking at explain only 80% of the variation. Up here, it's biased down, but you're still getting a very stable estimate of 3.49, 3.55, 3.69. This is a tool that, in principle, allows us to estimate the true dimension on average of a complicated agent-based model when we really don't know uh, what, the, what the important uh, uh, variables are. Uh, I am running out of time here. Uh, one thing is that the challenge is to decide when two agent-based agent -based models are equivalent to each other. And Daniel Hurd proved a totally useless theorem uh, that provides a condition uh, that would make two models equivalent up to a monotonic transform. Uh, but it's impossible to verify that condition. So we're sort of stuck there. Here are the conclusions. Agent-based models are an important new tool in simulation. Starting in the 1990s, they have become a standard technique in many different fields. But statistical theory for agent-based models is virtually non-existent. And my colleagues uh, have been remiss in not standing, stepping up to the plate and trying to develop uh, procedures for uh, doing inference with agent-based models. Uh, a key step in a formal ABM theory is a better understanding of the parameterization. Uh, and that's where we're talking about intrinsic dimension and stuff like that. Um, a second key step is the development of calibration methods for um, agent-based models. Uh, and right now, people rely upon face validity and it can miss important structure. Uh, a third area is uncertainty expression and all the simulations encounter this. Uh, ABM users have been slow to address it. The two tools are emulators or approximate Bayesian computation. And my sense is that uh, the emulators are the more mature theory. And realm statistical theory is being worked on. Uh, it's coming along, but not as fast as it should. And one of my purposes in giving this talk today is to try to encourage people to uh, be more enthusiastic about agent-based models. So that's my talk. I've gone for 40 minutes now, which was the time I was given. Uh, Noor, are there any questions that people have? Yeah. Um, so the first one that I have is, what are some shortcomings of using the emulator approach to um, determining uncertainty with an ABM? 
uh, shortcomings? Well, the emulator is an approximation to the ABM, so you're not getting the full detail that the ABM presumably wants to provide. Uh, and you heard about the discrepancy function. Uh, so the discrepancy function can tell you where your emulator is being a good, is being faithful to the agent-based model and where it's not. And that can tell you things you might do to improve your emulator. For example, there's a class of emulators that are more complicated called treed Gaussian processes. And if I found that there was a region where my weather forecasting was doing really bad, I might go with a treed Gaussian em process emulator instead in the hopes that that would improve the, uh, the fidelity there. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that as of right now, there is no way to produce a likelihood function for an ABM. There are some exceptions. Uh, Leah Johnson at Virginia Tech has done some ecological models where for sort of special cases, she can write down a likelihood function. I don't think that's uh, the way to go for the future because people are out using ABMs for really complicated uh, situations. So for any sort of, oh, dynamic social network modeling, for example, I don't think there's any hope of being able to write down a likelihood function. And that puts us in either the emulator or the ABC box. Mm -hmm. So perhaps because it's kind of um, being developed by different kinds of statistical machinery, will it also need different kinds of statistical tools to be able to assess performance and accuracy? Um, I don't think it's going to need fundamentally new theoretical breakthroughs. I think that uh, between ABC and emulators, we, we've covered the ground there. Uh, it's more uh, a matter of getting people in other disciplines to sort of regularly apply this. There are lots of ethologists out there. There are lots of ecologists out there. There are lots of economists out there who use agent-based models all the time but they don't attempt to try and quantify uncertainty the way a statistician would. Mm -hmm. And so one outcome is to have lots of people start to use emulators and then we'll discover how robust they are and get some insight into well, things like uh, ABMs do a great job of predicting how many new cases of Ebola are going to be. They do a lousy job of predicting where they're going to occur or they do a great job of predicting how many invasive species there are going to be in Australia, but they don't tell us where those invasive species will, will be. And so that better understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of ABMs strikes me as a really useful output from this type of study. Um, I'm quite surprised to hear that it's being heavily used by um, other domains, except for statisticians. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised by that too. Uh, in Europe, they're called individual-based models as opposed to agent-based models, but the same idea holds. You want to have simple rules and then look at the emergent behavior that comes from that. Uh, statisticians have been slow for a couple of reasons. One is that we didn't invent it, and so mm -hmm. we didn't have sort of an intellectual stake there. Uh, a second reason is that um, my culture came out of a math culture and math science is you want to prove theorems and that's great uh but that's not the world that abms play in abms are looking for you know weather forecasting or trying to predict how many people are going to buy a new yeah. product as a response of an ad there's a context uh, to it yes so those are some of the headwinds that have prevented us from getting involved uh having said that um Marion Farrar, Daniela D'Angelis, uh, Daniel Hurd, uh, Bevan Hooten, Chris Weichel, me, uh, uh, Vadim Sokolov. They're an emerging community of people who are interested in this, and, uh, and I hope it will come. Awesome. Um, and then one last question. Um, is there any data to support um, the comparison of ABMs versus a linear model? So you've given some examples of um, epidemiology or the spread of disease. Okay. Um, I don't mean to force the analogy. Um, an agent-based model is a model. A linear model is a model. Uh, the agent-based model is much more complex. 
it is certainly non-Euclidean. Uh, it has uh, weird parameters um, that you know just you know are weird, uh, and so we know exactly how to make goodness fit states, how to uh, fit parameters, how to uh, make quantified statements that are the linear model, but we really don't know how to do it for the agent-based model. And my view is they're both models. We ought to be able to try and figure out methodology that will make ABMs, inference with ABMs comparable to inference with linear regression. Well, that was all the questions I had. Um, thank you, you guys, for coming in and um, joining us today. And of course, thank you, Professor Banks, for joining us and giving us such a great presentation. It was absolutely pleasure. Um, of course. And then for you guys, if you would like to see more free content like this, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Nerf. Well, so Xiang's going to.